Hi, hello, welcome to Morbid Libations. Highly requested, and by highly requested, I mean about three people said they were interested. Bug Pinning 101. So first things first, you're going to want to find yourself a deceased insect. You will want to make sure it's, you know, passed on before you start this process. If you don't happen to have a dead bug yet, you have a live one, there are a couple methods of more um, humane ways to take care of it that leave its body well preserved. For the pinning process, you could catch them and then put them in the freezer for a couple hours. That's one method. You can also make a kill jar. That would involve getting a jar like this, putting a little bit of acetone in the bottom, and then layering a couple paper towels just so when you catch a bug and put it in there, the fume is enough to kill them. That usually works within a couple minutes. And the other way, which you do not want to do this for any kind of bug with scales, like moths or butterflies. I don't even use it for the lantern flies that I use just because I'm worried it'll dull the color of their wings even though they don't have scales. And you also don't want to use it for anything with hair, like if you're doing a particularly fuzzy little spider or something like a bumblebee or honeybee, you probably don't want to use this method either, but you could use rubbing alcohol and just preserve them like a wet specimen in rubbing alcohol. That would work both to kill the insect and to preserve them until you're ready to pin them. Keep them nice and lubricated. If you use the alcohol method, you can skip this first step. If you have a deceased insect that you've been allowing to dry out, such as this one, I've had this bug for a couple of weeks at this point. She's been in this jar, in the bottom of this jar. <laughs> I have a couple silica packets because my house doesn't have the best of climate control. So just to prevent any um, kind of mold growth, I do that. But honestly, at this time of year, it's really not necessary. It's a, more of a precaution than anything. I have on me a locally sourced, straight from my backyard, um, female spotted lanternfly. Just for the ethics standpoint, I like working with invasive species a lot because you are supposed to kill them anyways. So it's environmentally friendly. If you're watching this thinking, it is the end of November. I've missed my opportunity to catch something like that. Well, don't you worry because there are two other very invasive insects that I don't know about you, but frequently find their way into my house around this time of year. And that's going to be the Asian spotted lady beetle, which I have one in the freezer right now and the brown mermaided stink bug i it's the stink bug that we all know we know him i'll throw up a picture but that one invasive and funnily enough this is just a little fun fact both the spotted lanternfly and the brown stink bug their ground zero was my home state not great, but kind of interesting. So I'm gonna go ahead and get all my tools ready. Um, I just bought this kit. This is literally just a starting entomology kit that I bought off of Amazon. It came with some thin transparent paper for pinning their wings, two different pairs of uh, tweezers or forceps. So I have a flat pair with a paddle-like end to it. And then I have this pointed more angled pair of forceps. You're going to want one of each. Also came with pins and the part that we're actually going to be using right now, this lovely clear little box. And this is going to be our bug sauna. I am going to get my little deceased friend out of here. Um, as you can hear by the plop into my container, very dried out. I mentioned before, that this is a female spotted lanternfly. I know it's a female because the females are usually a little bit bigger and they have a little red spot on their, their butt, basically. I'm going to get a paper towel. I want it to be thoroughly damp, but not dripping. I don't want it to pool in the container. And I like to do it with hot water, as hot as I can like tolerate holding in my hands. And I'm gonna stick it in there with her and we're gonna give her a little spa day. I have two thoroughly dampened, but not like sopping wet paper towels. I like to put them like so. So she gets one corner and then they're kind of framed around her. 
and we're just going to seal everything up and you can see it's immediately steaming up in there this is going to get her nice and re-softened um, it's going to lubricate all her joints like if i were to try to pin her as she is right now all super dried out crispy those legs are going to snap right off so we're going to give her about a day and a half to two days in the bug sauna and then i will check back with you and we can see if she's ready to go so i checked back up on her in less than 24 hours luckily she was ready to go because if i wasn't able to get her out today i would have had to leave her for probably three to four days because i was going out of town if you're ever in a situation like that you can always just mix a little bit of rubbing alcohol in with the water you're using. It'll help prevent mold growth. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and start the pinning process. I'm getting all my tools out that I'm going to need, making sure I have both my pairs of forceps, my pins. These, I believe they're, yeah, they're a size two. Um, that's like considered the most universal sizing for pinning insects, but they make lots of different sizes and depending on what size specimen you're working with, you may need thinner or thicker ones. Entomology pins are made of stainless steel. That way, if you are using them for display purposes where you're going to leave them in the insect, they won't rust. If you're doing this with like a sewing pin or just pins that you found around your house, that might not be the case. So you may wanna take that into consideration. So what I'm doing right now, you saw me go up and down along the body a couple times. I was just lining up the best I could to get my pin centered. And I am just putting it right between the wings. And this will be the one and only pin we actually put into the insect It'll serve to hold them in place throughout the rest of the pinning process, and I'm just checking to make sure I like its positioning. It ended up going through crooked, and luckily this is a fairly forgiving process, so you'll see. I end up just pulling him off of the pin and giving it another go. Got it on the second try, and from this point forward, I'm going to go ahead and speed up the video. I feel pinning is fairly self-explanatory. And it's also just a very fiddly and slow process. It's a lot of back and forth. But at this point, I'm just gonna start getting all the legs untucked from underneath and figuring out how I want them. This is part of the process that will be easier if you kind of understand the anatomy you're working with. Um, for example, the first time I pinned a lanternfly, these front legs, I tried to pull them more to the side than to the front. And that really was just working against the anatomy of the insect. That's not how they naturally move. So I made it much harder for myself than it could have been. I would recommend kind of looking at examples of how the insect you're working with has been pinned before. Um, maybe even watch videos of how they move. It'll make this process easier. I'll also say once you do actually start pinning them in place, the most important piece of advice I can give you is think about your order of operations and how the pins you're putting in now will affect later steps of the process. So when I pin down the legs, I try really hard to angle my pins so when I pull the wings out later, um, they won't be in the way. So I'm just finishing up getting all the legs uncrossed and then I'm good to actually start pinning and positioning them. You can see I like using the hooks on their feet to hold things in place as I'm pinning, but you still will want to brace everything with pins, um, even if it seems really sturdy in the moment. As the insect dries out, the hooks really aren't strong enough alone, so brace everything like I said. If you don't, there's a really good chance that the legs will start lifting up and changing position. As I'm recording this voiceover, I've actually had this lantern fly drying out for maybe three days at this point. And I will say, go even heavier with bracing things than I do here, because I have had some lift happen with those front two legs that could have been avoided had I used just like two to four more pins. And that's why I'm making this kind of content, so you guys can learn from my mistakes and hopefully not repeat them. But even if you do, that's okay. Learning through trial and error is valid. I am very new to this hobby. I really just started um, collecting and pinning insects in about August. 
So while I love making this educational content and sharing what I learn through trial and error and research, if there's anybody watching this who has been doing this for longer than me, or even if you've just started, but you have other things that you've learned that I'm not covering in this video, feel free to share that in the comments. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. And you're about to see me bust out my little pieces of tracing paper. That means it is time to start pinning the wings. Um, anytime I'm handling the wings, I'm using my paddle forceps. Um, it gives you more surface area, so you're less likely to accidentally tear them while trying to get them in place. And this would be a task that's probably easier if I had a more traditional pinning board. So a traditional pinning board is usually three pieces of styrofoam or cork, two pieces layered on top, one on the bottom, and the two on top have a split in the middle that creates space for the insect's body to go in. That way you can lay the wings out completely flat. The main reason why I don't use one of those for the lantern flies is because then I wouldn't have enough space for the legs to be spread the way I have them. But if you're not concerned with the legs, you just want the wings spread using a board like that would probably make this a thousand times easier. When you use a board like that, you can use big pieces of tracing paper to just fully cover and press the wings flat. However, because I am doing this the hard way, I just like to use tiny pieces and I, once I get the pin in place along the edge of the wing, I push down that tracing paper as flush to the wing as I can have it. That way, rather than having the pressure of the wing against that thin little point of the needle or the pin, we want more surface area against the wings to prevent tearing. So the pressure should be against the paper rather than against the pin if you can help it. And then you'll see I end up doing something kind of experimental with the bottom pair of wings. I've noticed whenever I use the tracing paper method on the bottom wings, they often end up getting kind of smushed down in a way that I don't like. So rather than putting tracing paper on top, I end up just giving the wings a little bit of support with a pin underneath them. I feel like that better suits the anatomy of this insect, but I'll let you know if it turns out well or not in the end. I've never done it this way before. And once I'm happy with how I have it pinned, I'll just leave them in a warm, dry place to dry out for like three to seven days. It's been a couple of days. I finished pinning her on a Friday. Today is Monday. I'm probably still gonna give it like two, three more days before I unpin it. Because I have only worked with smaller specimens, I always just dry them out in the open air in my house. <laughs> The air is super dry with um, my heat being on and everything, so that's always worked out for me. I don't have experience with any of these techniques, but I have heard of people, if you're in a rush to get something dried out, using um, a hair dryer on a low setting to kind of help speed up the process. I've also heard of people putting them in their oven at the lowest temperature. Once again, I've never done that. That one kind of freaks me out, I'm kind of scared, but if anybody watching this has experience doing that or wants to give it a test and let us know how it goes, <laughs> I'd be happy to hear the results. The other way, which this isn't one that I think would be accessible to most people, but freeze drying apparently is a pretty successful and immediate way to dry out specimens. So. If that's something you have access to, that would be an option. So now that we have our fully dried out specimen, we can go ahead and remove the pins to get them ready for display. You could, if you were going to glue them down, remove the central pin too that um, stabilize them for the pinning process, but I chose to leave it in. Um, you might notice this is not the lantern fly we were working with before. This is actually a male that I pinned previously who has a couple little tears in his wings. But there we go. And then I, because I want to keep the pin in for display, um, I'm just going to go ahead and scooch him as close to the top as I can. And then I will use a pair of wire cutters to remove the pin's head. And because this video is already so lengthy, I'm not really going to go into the process for displaying the insects, 
But if that's something you're curious about, I could make a separate video kind of exploring different options there. I'm gonna go ahead and leave it here. If you made it all the way to this point, thank you so much for watching. I really hope that this was helpful. If you have any questions that I didn't touch on, feel free to leave them in the comments and I will get to them. If you enjoyed this and wanna see more of this kind of long form educational content, make sure to give the video a like, subscribe if you wanna see me ever again. You know, if you have a weirdo in your life, go ahead and share it with them. I'm hoping to have an Etsy shop up soon to sell the bugs that you see me pinning here. So keep an eye out for that. I'll probably put up a video announcing when that goes live. But thank you so much. Good luck out there. <laughs> I hope that this has been helpful and I'll see you in the next video. <laughs> okay, bye.